Hi, I'm Owen from REST Australia. Thanks for tuning in to the REST Network. Before we get into today's show, there are a few things we have to go over. Firstly, what you're about to hear and see is limited to general information only. It's not personal financial advice like you get from a financial planner. Also, it's important to remember that past performance is not indicative of future performance. That means that anything that's happened in the past, or we say today, is not necessarily going to reflect what happens in the future. Lastly, please consider that any of the guests or myself are featuring on this program may have a financial interest in some of the products or shares mentioned. That's enough from me. I hope you enjoyed today's program. David, thanks for taking some time to join me on the podcast. No worries, mate. Thanks a lot for having me. Yeah, it's, uh, I've been looking forward to this for a while because um, we've never met. This is our first time speaking, but I've heard a lot about you. And in fact, I remember, I think it may have even been before I started RAS, because this is going back many years. I used to see your name everywhere because of um, like your, your writing and your insights on ETFs. Um, and that was going back many, many years ago. So um this is an exciting one for me. We're going to talk about, we're going to get in the weeds a bit. So if you want to get in the weeds, if you're watching or listening to this and you want to get in the weeds of ETFs, David is your guy. So um, no pressure, no pressure, mate. Uh, we're going to talk about all of it. We're going to talk about commodities. We're going to talk about what goes in uh, inside an ETF and what actually happens uh, and the market at large. But just some icebreaker questions to kick us off, mate. Um, you've spent time as like a journalist and writing about ETS for a very long time. You've been around the funds management landscape for a very long time. So you've seen people all around the world talk about finance and investing. So I'm curious who would be the best finance presenter that you've come across and why? Yeah, the person I've been most impressed with is, this may sound like a bit of a cliched answer, but Jack Bogle, the legendary founder of Vanguard, um, he, he could have, you know, been a hedge fund zillionaire, but he decided to set Vanguard up as a not-for-profit. And he had a very, very simple message about fees. And the simple message was always that um, the compounding of, you know, your wealth that you invest in stocks or ETFs or whatever is offset by the compounding of fees. And he stuck to it. Um, he, he never lost his common man's touch, no matter how famous or well-recognized he became. Um, and yeah, he was, he was a magician. So for, for me, it's... Very much him. Mm. Mm. That's um, that's a fair response, and I've never had that response. So why not? Um, like you say, a bit cliche, obviously. Um, yeah. Working with Global yeah. X ETF Securities before that, like I, I, I get it. Yeah. Um, but um, okay. So another, I want to ask you another question about a person that you might remark yeah. about, which is like a person that you have personally interviewed or met, uh, and what you learned from them. Sure. Um, and so, as a back in my back in my days as a journalist, the the most formidable person I ever interviewed, I think, was the the then chief executive of Magellan, Brett Cairns. Um, I was trying to get stuck into him about uh, some of the ways that Magellan was working, and um, I just got shredded. I got rinsed. He was all over me. He was better than I was, smarter than I was. He had answers to everything, and um, yeah, that, I, I lost that for sure. Um, <laughs> Yeah, a very humbling, a very humbling interview. And so uh, it would be Brett. I don't think he's there anymore, but um, yeah. Yeah, sure. okay. okay. Right. So you're asking the hard questions and he's and he's just played them straight back. Uh, yeah, basically. Yeah, Yeah. right. Okay. Yeah. And this final question, which is a short answer one, is um, just a bit of fun, which is like if you could acquire one skill, um, so it could be like speed reading, it could be anything that you would find very handy either in your personal or your professional life, what would it be? So I'm not sure if this is a, you'd class this as a skill, but it's a, definitely an ability that I'd like. I'd like the, I'd like to be able to sleep less. I'm one of these people that needs seven hours of sleep a night. All right. You know, just sort of a, the walking dead, but my colleagues around the office, they get by on four routinely. I can't do it. Think of all the extra time in a day you'd have if you, you know, if you could do that, sleep four hours. I, I can't do it. What about you? Yeah, I, I couldn't do that, but um, burnout would happen pretty quick. But yeah, um, that would be a superpower in itself for yeah, sure. Yeah, I see. Yeah, I do sure. see some motivational videos on Instagram or elsewhere right. about people that claim to fit in multiple days within one day. I don't know yeah. how the math works or the yeah. science, but uh, yeah, interesting. I like it, mate. Good response. Great response. So um, to switch gears and, and dig a little deeper, um, normally when I have someone on the, on the show, I'd ask them like how you got into investing, yeah. um, who influenced you and so on and so forth. But I think I might, I would, I think that'd be too easy for you to answer. I'm guessing. Um, yeah. so maybe, um, you could just instead 
tell us like one thing that you've learned from your family when it comes to business investing um, or any of that sort of stuff, finance, money, yeah. et cetera. So the number one thing I've learned from my father, and from my family, when it comes to investing is the dangers of overconfidence. The people that get in trouble in investing and in finance are always the same. They're overconfident young men who go and blow themselves up. It's that old, you know, that Mark Twain quote, it's not what you uh, don't know that gets you. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. Mm. So that's been the number one thing I'd say that I have learned. Um, if anyone's interested, uh, there's this body of um, literature uh, in, uh, the psycho in psychological literature on this. I think it's, it's called Dunning-Kruger or something to that effect. Um, you know, people that don't know anything and tend to be the most confident ones. And that similarly, the psychological literature tends to find that everyone thinks they're better looking, smarter, better at driving than they actually are. Everyone's, you know, a yeah. little bit of a narcissist, albeit to varying degrees. Um, and interestingly, just to carry on, carry on this thought, uh, the psychologists find that the best people at predicting their own skills, their own abilities are manic depressives for some reason. So people with depression tend to have the most realistic uh, estimations of their own abilities. But um the, the one thing I've learned is um, the dangers of that and how, just how much that can cost you. So for my father, for, for the family office, uh, he, he only really invests in things that he fully understands um, and things that he knows very, very intimately. Um, he's got a circle of competence and he sticks with it and he doesn't really stray outside it at all. And I'd say that's the number one thing that I've learned from him. Stick with what you know. That wouldn't always be easy, right? Because sometimes you would have temptations or alluring opportunities so to speak that could lead you astray right yeah absolutely and i think that's something we've seen with certain areas certain areas in the market like certain pockets of miners certain kinds of blockchain technology people have sort of been chasing something that they don't fully understand they've seen prices rise very quickly and been attracted to that but yeah there's definitely a discipline element that comes into it Mm. it's you know one thing to know something it's another thing to act on it so yeah there's a discipline element there too for sure mm. um like i said at the opening the top of the mm. show that i'm pretty sure i was reading you long before like i had started fast like back in my my earlier days and i was hearing the the things that you were coming up with and i don't think at the time you were in australia i think you were overseas writing a lot of this stuff um but one thing we haven't really done on the show is we haven't really taken a timeline of the rise and rise and rise of ETFs or even where the first seeds were planted and how that has evolved over time. So I think it would be really useful for you to describe how ETFs came to be and kind of bring us up to now. And then I might have some follow on questions of like, where do we go from here? Sure. So the industry really got going as sort of an offshoot of index investing, which in many respects is the year Vanguard. Vanguard was very much the pioneer of it. Um, now, index investing itself um, has its roots in the academic revolt against Wall Street in the 1970s. So um, a lot of academics were fed up with Wall Street's high fees. They were fed up with its racketeering. They were fed up with its dishonest marketing. You know, there's a whole lot of reasons people can and have been angry with Wall Street. And that's sort of where the index investing movement got going. Um, so the ETF industry, and then when, when it started in the 1990s and the early 2000s, it still sort of had that vibe and feel to it. It was, it was very idealistic. It attracted a lot of young adventurers that, you know, felt they had not much, not as much to lose and a lot to gain. And so the type of personality, the type of people we saw in the industry back then tended to be, you, you didn't really get, you know, like the CV stackers, your resume jockeys who, you know, like to get internships at fancy places, get into the top universities and all the rest of it. You didn't really have that then because it wasn't really a prestigious established industry at all. Um, mm. So a lot of the founding fathers, so to speak, of this industry look really unimpressive on paper. You, know, you, read, you read their CVs and there's, like, oh, there's nothing there. So that's sort of how it started. It started out as sort of like a, an academic revolt against um, traditional high fee fund managers and sort of worked its way through from there. And that's still in some respects where it is today. Um, how it's changed over the past 20 years well, it's now a multi-trillion dollar global industry. Um, it's very established. Um, the type of people we're seeing enter it has changed. Um, the types of structures we're building are more and more esoteric. 
but um does that does that really answer your question a bit of a yeah when we did response there it does because in in a way because um it, it was interesting to me because if i'm not mistaken vanguard wasn't the first one to have an index fund they were second no, i believe right. yeah that's right that, uh, but as you said, they are the pioneer is probably the right mm -hmm. phrase for index funds. But then where did, where, when did the first ETFs launch? Yeah, so the first ETFs launched in Canada, if I'm not mistaken, um, with a lot of encouragement from the exchange. Then the first ETF, of course, that launched in the United States, which is still the largest ETF in the world today, is SPY, which was launched by State Street, again, with encouragement from, from the exchange. And I think, oh, stretching my brain here a little bit. I think they're a bit over 25 years old now, or even, or is it 30 years old? Spy, I should, I should know that. But uh, <laughs> I think it's something in my mind. I'm pretty sure Spy is 30 years old. But okay. yeah, it's a long way. So that's where they started. Um, and a, a lot of the original ideas actually didn't come from the ETF industry itself. I mean, sort of a reverse inquiry process. So the, the, um, the, the sector trackers from State Street came from, I think, the index providers um, and stuff like that. But um. Hmm. Yeah, so I think I sort of botched that answer there. Maybe. No, no. Right. Yeah. no, 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 that's yeah. that's 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 great. Um, so how about here in Australia? Do you mm -hmm. know what the first ETFs were? Yeah, so here in Australia, the first one was STW by State Street. Um, I think it was called Street Trackers back in the day, and that's where the ticker STW comes from. Oh. Um, it was invented to do the simple thing and just invest in the you know ASX 200 companies on a market weighted basis and give people in many respects an alternative way to trade futures. Hmm. Um, the next one that came along uh, was the gold ETF. Well, one of the next ones that came along was the gold ETF, which was, of course, um, built by my dad. And that just provided a way to trade gold bars on exchange, essentially. So that's the history of them here in Australia. Then you're right. In Australia, Vanguard was a relatively late comer. Um, mm -hmm. They came along about five, ten years after the first ETFs were introduced. But um, they're now the runaway largest, yeah. largest provider. Yeah. The, the, the gold ETF um, mm. that your family uh, started, was that yep. the first gold ETF in the world? It was, yep. So gold ETFs, yeah, they're born and raised here in Australia. Yeah, um, yeah interesting, interesting story, that one. Um, took a lot of a, a lot of skepticism to overcome a lot of uh legal maneuvering that had to be you know done to get you know regulators and the market comfortable with this concept um but yeah they provided a way to trade gold bars on exchange so historically when people wanted to invest in gold they sort of had one of two ways of doing it uh they could go out and buy gold bars from a local bullion dealer like your abc bullion or they could buy shares in gold miners um so what the gold etf essentially did and still does is smush those two things together so you buy bars of gold but you buy them on exchange in the same way that you would shares in a gold mining company so it really just brought those that would touch like brought those two uh two things together mm. um here's a more technical question for you is how does the the market making process differ for a gold like a physical gold ETF versus say like, so like a gold mining ETF, like you can just buy, it's just like an equity ETF. It's just by like the STW or whatever you, you want to talk about. But how does it make the market for gold bullion? Yeah, no, that, that's an excellent question. So the way a gold mining ETF works, like a, the, an ETF that holds shares in gold miners, it works the same as any other ETF that holds shares. The market maker or which uh, market makers are specialized trading companies like Susquehanna, like Jane Street, um, that work very closely with the exchange, with the ASX or with SIBO to ensure that ETFs trade throughout the day. Um, the market maker will go and buy the shares in the index, uh, bring them to the ETF provider and then get given units of the ETF in return. The way it works for a gold bullion ETF like ours is the market maker will go and buy gold. So bars of gold, um, bring them to us, and in return, we'll give them units in the ETF. So for gold mining, you bring shares in the gold mining companies, and for a gold bullion ETF, you go and buy the bars of gold. Uh, where people sometimes get a little bit confused here is they say, well, where do they go buy the gold bars of gold from, and how do they deliver it to you? Do they like bring a forklift to your front yeah. door or something? Like, where does, where, how does this all work? And the answer is 70% um, of gold worldwide is um, traded on a specialist gold trading exchange in London called the LBMA. So the market makers almost always buy the gold from there. And the LBMA is very, very highly coordinated with um, 
gold custodian banks. And so once you buy gold on, on the LBMA, um, it, it's a pretty straightforward, very, pretty well-worn path to, you know, have the gold moved around in either forklifts or planes or whatever else and get them moved to the bank vault when necessary. Does that mean that the process is quite costly? Uh, no, not really, um, simply because um, here's where things get a little bit more, things get a little bit more technical again. Most of the time, the gold bars don't actually move. So if you go to JP Morgan's bank vault, for instance, JP Morgan's one of the largest custodians of gold bullion in the world, or HSBC's bank vault for that matter, what you'll find is there's like lots of separate piles um, and with like sort of different companies' names on them. And so what tends to happen is, you know, when the gold moves into our ETF, say, because we're creating new ones, um, the person that the market maker is buying the gold off will also have a gold custody account with JP Morgan. And so what will then happen is JP Morgan will just pick up the gold bars on their forklift, move them from one pile into our pile in the room. So that tends to be what happens. But um, every now and then, not so often, it can get a bit more expensive and a bit more involved. You have to stick the gold bars on planes or whatever else. But um, for the most part, it just moves around within JP Morgan's bank vault in London, just by forklifts mostly. Yeah. So... That's fascinating, right? And that's a really good explanation. I really appreciate you taking the time to, to explain that. Right. A, a question that, and we, this is like a big topic, which we're going to tackle in multiple different ways, is a big topic is that with gold ETS in particular, um, by the way, for those people that don't know who have just tuned in, um, Global X is a long-term sponsor of our Australian finance podcast. And uh, the issuer of the GOLD gold ETF, you should read the product disclosure statement, um, and speak with your financial advisor, as always. Uh, but, mate, a lot of people criticise gold ETFs for moving the market. So yeah. more people buying gold ETFs mean more back and forth or shuffling of those piles, so to speak, somehow then influences the price to go up. Mm. How do you think about that? Well, personally, it's absolutely true. There's no denying that. It's uh, the gold, gold ETFs, money moving in and out of gold ETFs do determine the gold price. And if you look at the World Gold Council, which is um, the mine, gold mining company's lobby, they actually model it. They uh, on, their, on their website, they've got how much money is moved in and out of gold ETFs. This is one of the leading indicators on which way the gold price is going to go. Um, so, yeah, no, it's firstly, I mean, it's, it's spot on. It's perfectly accurate. Uh, is that a problem? Uh, in my opinion, no, it's not, simply because ETFs have just become a focal point for buying gold just because they're safer and more secure. Previously, before ETFs came along, a lot of the time what would set the gold price would be people buying and selling gold directly from bullion dealers, um, and that could set the gold price in the same way. But um, with that, you know, with people buying from bullion dealers, they had to source their own security. They often had to pay quite large fees to the dealers every time they wanted to trade. Um, and so you obviously, you'll, I'm sure you already know this, Kerry Packer, for instance, he had $5 million worth of gold stolen from his bank vault in his office in Sydney, right? So even he couldn't sort security for it. Um, now, instead of going to the bullion dealers, they're just going to the gold ETFs. So you've got the same phenomenon occurring and it's just in a different place, basically. So I don't see it as a huge problem. But um, obviously, uh, anyone listening to this is welcome to draw their own conclusion. But yes, it is true. Flows in and out of gold ETFs do help determine the gold price. Mm. Um, okay, I'm going to switch gears a little bit. Uh, we'll come back to gold in a minute. But um, so before you mentioned like the past and the present of ETFs, according to the ASX's um, monthly data for April 2023, if I'm not mistaken, there are about 100, there's about $142 billion invested in ETFs on the exchange. Uh, and then the REIT market, which is to provide context for folks, was a, about that same level. So it looks like ETFs will push through that if they haven't already. Uh, we're at the end of May recording this. Um, and there are, you know, well over 200 products in the market. So a question that people are constantly fielding is, is the ETF market in a bubble? And I guess mm. an adjacent question is like, how big can it get? All right. Yeah, we, we do hear the um, the old question, uh, ETFs in a bubble quite often. Um, for, from, from, from my perspective, it's a straightforward answer, and that is that is no. ETFs are just a, a vehicle for holding an asset. They're just a fund like any other kind of fund, whether it's a superannuation fund, if it's a retail managed fund or whatever. And there is, they're worth as much or as little as the assets that are held inside them. So 
to take an example, like I, would, I, I take it uh, to use an ETF that I, I take it that our people that may be listening to this will be familiar with VAS, Vanguard's Australian Shares ETF, which is the largest in the country. It just does the simple thing of go out and buy the largest 300 companies in Australia. Um, is the, what, what, what does it mean to say that is a bubble? I mean, the fund itself, if you empty, empty of it all its shares, it's worthless. It can't possibly be in a bubble. What could be in a bubble is the ASX 300, the shares that it's holding. But I don't know. That, I can throw that question over to you, Owen. Do you think the ASX 300 is in a bubble at the moment? Well, I guess I guess the thing, so the Michael uh, Burry quote was this one, yeah. David, which was that, and I don't know how simplistic this is, is, hmm. the, say, take VAS, for example. Yeah. Yes. ASX 300, I don't know the exact amount that's in VAS right now. So as I say, $11 billion. I don't know exactly what it is. But say everyone tried to sell at the same time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What would that do to mm -hmm. the market? And what would that do to prices in the market? I think, well, obviously, it would have a huge distorting impact, mm -hmm. no doubt. But like, I think that's the fear, is that like, if contagion kind of sweeps into different asset classes and people are all trying to sell then there's like a trigger to the downside of automated selling through etfs yeah okay there's a there's a few points to raise there um the, the first is um etfs don't necessarily contribute to aggregate demand for assets or uh and they don't necessarily contribute to aggregate supply either so when you see money moving into etfs you see all these big flows or whatever else um so you know however many billion dollars surging into vanguard's etfs through the the, uh, the, or into ours for that matter too. Um, a lot of that is just money that's already in the market anyway. So it's money that's invested directly in the ASX 200, share, ASX 300 shares or in units of a fund that already track something very similar to the ASX 300. So what we often see is a lot of the money that moves into ETFs is already in a very, very similar type of product or in a similar type of vehicle. And it's just essentially the market's moving, uh, the, the money's moving sideways. So from one you know, one fund to another fund or from shares within the index to an ETF that tracks that index. So it's not necessarily clear that ETFs do contribute to aggregate demand, because obviously if they did contribute to aggregate demand, you could make the argument that they're driving prices up um, and therefore contributing to a bubble if there were one. So, uh, I mean, that's the first point. It's not necessarily clear that they're doing that. Um, if everyone to, uh, that's a, a question we do often here, what would happen if um, everyone were to sell uh, their, their ETFs at the same time, if there were some market meltdown, for instance. And I'd suggest just simply look at what happened during uh, COVID in uh, 2020, right? We had massive selling and massive buying at the same time. And what happened? I mean, same, same as normal, really. Um, mm -hmm. With ETFs, obviously, they're not like a, uh, they're not like a list investment trust or a list investment company. You can immediately redeem an ETF for the shares that it holds or for the asset holds throughout the trading day whenever you wish. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, if ever any price difference or price dislocation emerges between an ETF and the assets that it holds, you get an, you get an arbitrage opportunity. So you just buy whichever is cheaper, you buy low and you sell whichever is more expensive, sell high. Mm. So I think we've got a number of we've we've been through the financial crisis, we've been through COVID, we've been through a number of flash crashes along the way, and I mean we're we're pretty well we're we're a pretty well tested concept at this stage. Mm. I, I would argue, I would argue, others might see things differently. Mm. That's fair, um, but I guess this is also assumes that the underlying securities inside of an ETF are liquid too, right? Yeah. And that's a, that's a very, very good question. And that's a very good point where we have seen some issues with some ETFs. And we did see this during COVID, in fact, and where pricing became a little bit unstuck was with those exact ETFs that you point out that the assets they hold don't trade very often. So the key, the sort of the chink in the armor here, so to speak, that we saw during COVID was some bond ETFs. I don't want to name names because I don't want to be <laughs> scared of you pulling punches against some of our competitors, but uh, yeah. Some of them did start trading on discounts and did start trading at uh, mm. some pretty funky, funky prices. And the reason for that is um, we spoke about that arbitrage opportunity that emerges whenever ETFs trade at you know a different price to the assets they hold. That arbitrage channel only holds insofar as, like you said, the underlying assets of an ETF are as liquid as the ETF itself. Now, what happens in the bond market, and especially for some esoteric and uh, obscure bonds, is they don't really trade very often. Mm. So the banks will warehouse them on the books and don't, don't tend to move them around too much. So when COVID came along, the, the there was no real market for these bonds that these ETFs held. 
So ETF sort of absorbed all the selling pressure. And yeah, we did see some pricing dislocations in some bond ETFs during COVID, absolutely. But for the 90, 99% majority of the market, it was just business as usual. Mm. Yeah. Oh, and, yeah, good um, point. Good point. Yeah, some people can, I'm sure if you're really keen to understand which ETFs they might be, you can just look back in time and look yeah. at the ETF price against what we call the net asset value and you can check yeah. it. Um, yeah. And with the uh, the data that's published by ETF providers and the ASX, you can see spreads and that sort of stuff, which is really yeah. insightful. Um, yeah, I just think that's quite uh, interesting. So, so we're at 140 billion now, and I was just pulling up yeah. some numbers from the US market, um, and it's a sh like obviously much much greater in size, huge. Um, yeah. So I've got a it looks like a number here from ETFs represent 12.7 percent of equity assets in the US. This is for the first quarter of 2023. 7.8% in Europe and 4.1% in Asia Pacific. And, yeah. and um, it says it's only a fraction of the total market. Um, mm. I don't know the exact number here in Australia, but I'd imagine ETFs are still a tiny portion yeah, of that market. Yeah. yeah. So if it's, so we could, I don't know what the number is off the top of my head of, ET, of index funds as a percentage of the market as well, but mm. I, I'd assume that based on what you were saying, that this could, like, this is a, a market which we could expect to get much bigger. Yeah, so for the past few years, the compound annual growth rate of the ETF industry has been about 35%. Uh, so if you compound that forward, we'd expect the industry to be about 200 billion in 2025 and 1 trillion uh, early next decade. So that, there's obviously a huge simplifying assumption there. Mm. But um, yeah, if you, if you do yeah, bring those numbers forward, that's what you would expect. And it's, yeah. a, pretty, yeah, it's a pretty strong growth arc. Yeah, for, for um, ETF providers, it's kind of like an eye-watering kind of number yeah. to assume that it could get that big, which is yeah. incredible. Um, so people know Global X for a lot of like thematic style ETFs, but also like some gold, like gold ETF that goes in the core of many investors' portfolios. Um, but one thing that people also know Global X for is things like commodity ETFs more broadly and exposure to physical... Uh, products and physical commodities but there are some etfs in the market that provide exposure to what we call synthetic etfs when it relates to commodities so these are if i'm not mistaken david etfs that provide exposure to uh, say like a commodity that can't be held on the premise like oil for example uh, because it's too hard to hold a container a ship shipping like a, a container ship of oil uh, in the ETF provider's office. So they use derivatives to get exposure to that, uh, to the oil price using futures contracts or whatever. Can you ex can you describe, because we've touched on this only ever briefly in the sh on the show, can you describe that process of synthetic uh, commodity ETFs? Yeah, absolutely. So there's ETFs fall into two main bu buckets, two main kinds, physical and synthetic. Physical is probably the easiest starting point just because it tends to be what most people are familiar with. Uh, physical ETFs do the simple thing. So if you've got a physical NASDAQ 100 ETF, it just goes and buys shares in the NASDAQ 100. If you've got a physical gold ETF, it just goes and buys the glass of gold. Simple, done, sorted. People like it because it's secure. So if you own the gold ETF, you own the gold, you own the glass of gold. If you own the NASDAQ 100 ETF, you own shares in the NASDAQ 100. Easy. Synthetic are a little bit more complicated they get their exposure through derivatives contracts of various kinds. So sometimes it'll be swaps, sometimes it'll be futures, sometimes it'll be options or something else. The um, thing that gets people a little bit nervous around synthetic ETFs is they don't necessarily like derivatives too much. Uh, and for, there, there's, some, there's some justice for that. Obviously, um, if you're buying in derivatives, you're buying the credit risk of whichever institution's issuing them. Sometimes mm. it'll be an exchange in the case of futures or an investment bank in the case of swaps or whatever else. But um, yeah, synthetic ETFs do have advantages, though, um, even though they're not necessarily people's preferred tool. And I think synthetic ETFs only account for like 5% of the ETF market globally. Uh, but the big advantage that synthetic ETFs have is tax. So if you buy a physical NASDAQ 100 ETF, for instance, um, you'll find that you have to pay dividend withholding tax. So the Americans charge a 15% tax on dividends to people living outside the US. But if you go the synthetic route and you buy into the NASDAQ 100 via futures, you don't necessarily have to pay that tax. So there are potential, there are some advantages here and there to synthetic as well, but they are potentially more risky and they're only a small part of the overall market. How does, so in terms of, okay, so that's interesting about the tax. I didn't actually know that off the top. I couldn't recall it 
come across that. So that's really interesting to me. Um, a lot of the times people see the, the, the performance of a synthetic ETF and it deviates from what they think they're getting. Um, can you talk about that and why that happens? Yeah, so there's two kinds of deviation that you can have with a synthetic ETF. The first is the kind that you like to see, which is where the ETF actually does better than its index, you know, so outperformance. You're not meant to get that on an ETF, but you can actually have that because of mm. uh, either superior transaction transaction cost efficiencies or superior tax efficiencies. So that that's the first time, the first type you can get, and that's the type that people tend not to have too much of a problem with. The other type you can get, of course, is when there's something, so there's something suspicious or there's something faulty or something 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 negative happens with the derivative um so you know you can get bad pricing on a swap you can have uh, you can have some kind of uh, uh, uh circuit breaker get triggered on futures or something like that so you can you can get that as well in um in synthetic etfs it's very rare a very rare i should say but mm. i guess I'm, yeah i'm not i'm not familiar with too many instances if any of it being sustained how about, how about in terms of like contracts rolling over and the cost associated with that? Oh, so for like, uh, so when you've got, um, you've got like a synthetic, so, so like a synthetic ETF and the contract yeah. which is expiring, they've got a roll. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a, another thing that sort of gets people, um, gets people a, a bit confused about futures. So futures and options have uh, expiry dates. And it's a fascinating story as to why that is. So when the futures market sort of got going in the 1980s, the American regulators took the view that uh, if you don't have an expiry date on um, a futures contract, it's just a wager. It's just gambling. So mm -hmm. we're going to regulate it as if it were gambling, basically. So for that reason, all um, futures contracts uh, sort of have, have these expiry dates to get around gambling laws, so to speak. Huh. Um, yeah, another. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, I, I, no, I don't know that. Too. Yeah, I've, I've had it recently myself. The... Um, but yeah, that does mean that when one futures contract expires, you've got to roll over um, into the into the next into the next contract. Um, where things get a little bit confusing and a little bit technical is that these the contract expiring and the contra the contract that's getting delivered, um, they can trade at different prices. Mm. Sometimes that can be for the better. You know, if you the one you're selling is more expensive than the one you're buying, you make a little a little bit of profit uh, as you roll, so to speak. But more often, what tends to happen is it works the other way, which is the one you're selling is. Mm. Uh, a bit cheaper than the one you're buying. So you lose a little bit as you go. And that's quite common in um, commodity, like as you suggested, in commodity futures ETFs. It's called Contango, mm -hmm. if anyone wants to look up that, uh, that, that piece of jargon. Um, and yeah, it is, a, it is potentially a, a, a limitation for futures-backed commodity ETFs. I might be catching you off guard here, but is there anything that you can remember, any time that you can remember when one of these ETFs didn't have liquidity? One of these ETFs didn't have liquidity, so as in they hit hit some issues with the underlying assets that they hold. Yeah, the underlying derivatives. Yeah, yeah. There's a, there there were there were a couple of issues, especially around oil based futures ETFs during COVID. Um, we had the highly unusual situation where uh, no one no one wanted to, and I mean virtually no one wanted to buy buy oil futures, so they started trading on negative prices. Um, and that's a remarkable thing if you think about it, negative mm. pricing. So that is people are paying to give away their asset. So here, take it from me. I'll pay you to take it off my hands. Mm. Um, it only lasted for a very short space, space of time because in an efficient market, you'd imagine you'd never get negative pricing, right? Why on earth would anyone pay you to take something valuable off them? Um, but yeah, we did have that issue in, uh, with some oil ETFs. I've got to say some of these oil ETFs actually dodged a bullet they sold out of these futures that um, started to trade on negative prices a, a mere days before, you know, they blew up. And so investors, it's hard to say whether it was skilled management or whether there was, you know, a bit of luck, but um, investors managed to, you know, dodge that bullet, so to speak. But um, yeah, that would be one instance. But yeah, COVID was in many respects kind of like the ultimate mm. test for mm. all types and all structures of ETFs. And um, yeah, that, that was potentially a snag that we hit. Um, yeah, and it seems to have survived pretty well, which is great news. Yeah. Um, so, obviously, um, Global X uh, mm. and e slash ETF Securities before that, ETF Securities was the original um, like launch pad for gold ETFs. And um, you guys recently crossed your 20 year anniversary of that. Yeah. Um, and in that time, the, the ETF has grown to be by far Australia's biggest gold ETF. 
people use it in their core portfolios. People tend to use, some people use it in like, in, like a more of a satellite or tactical allocation uh, for different macro environments for whatever reason. Can you maybe talk to some of the drivers of gold, like the, the virtues of gold as an asset class and where you see it sitting in a portfolio? Yeah, so the way we tend to speak about gold is to think of it sort of like an insurance policy. So when you buy home insurance or buy car insurance, I, I presume you have one or both of those things. Yeah, both. Yep. Yeah. Chances are you don't want your car to explode. You don't want your heart house to burn down and all the rest of it. And you're sort of happy to, you know, pass that money out every month or every year or however often you pay your premiums because you understand that were the worst to happen, were your car to catch fire or your house mm. to catch fire, the insurance would come into bat for you. Um, gold has a similar property in this respect. When the world turns pear-shaped, gold tends to be one of the assets that's best performing. So at the time we're speaking, which is the, the very end of May 2023, gold's been comfortably outperforming shares, comfortably outperforming bonds over the past 12 months. But, you know, in over that period of time, uh, there's war in Eastern Europe, inflation is out of control, banks are collapsing, the share market and the bond market aren't great places. So like an insurance policy, gold goes into bat for you when times get a bit rough. So that's how we tend to think of gold. Uh, gold, for the larger part, won't uh, do the heavy lifting in your portfolio that shares and bonds will, but um, it will provide effective diversification and act a bit like an insurance policy in down markets. So mm. that's how we think of it. Mm. So you see a lot of people using, not like just gold generally speaking, or the gold mm. product, um, you see people using that um, as like a mainstay in a core portfolio. Yes, we do. So we, uh, the way our clients tend to use allocate to it is it'll be a smaller allocation, say about 5% during the good times. But um, obviously you understand uh, how, how it works, the, the, the mathematics works during, during the down times when everything else falls. If gold rises or stay the, stays the same, it goes from being 5% to being potentially quite, you know, quite a fair bit larger than that by virtue of, you know, other prices falling. But that's usually the allocation parameter we see, about 5% or so. Mm. Um how about in terms of drivers of the gold price? So, so we mentioned before that ETFs <laughs> have an impact on setting the gold price, uh, but like longer term, what do you, what if, what do you believe it is that drives the gold price higher? So statistically, the two best predictors of which way the gold price is going to go are the strength of the US dollar and real interest rates on the ten-year US Treasury. So the dollar is probably the more simple one to explain. So most gold globally is bought by Chinese people and by Indian people. And yet gold for the larger part trades in US dollars. So when the US dollar falls in value, it becomes easier for Chinese people and for Indians to buy US dollars and by extension, easier for them to buy gold. This then supports demand and supports prices. So a weaker US dollar is good for gold. And we see that in other commodities too, be it oil, be it copper, be it whatever else. So that's one of the most important variables. And you do see this if you look at the correlations. I mean, through, over the past five years or so, the correlation between the gold price and the US dollar index is about 0 0.5. So there's a pretty good, statistically, there's a pretty good argument you can make that the US dollar is predicted the gold price. The other thing, and potentially the more important thing, but a little bit more nuanced one, is uh, real interest rates on the 10-year US Treasury. Um, so... As a general rule, when real interest rates are low, real interest rates means I'm adjusted for inflation um, and you're essentially not really earning any interest on your cash or on your bonds, gold tends to rally. The reason is um, when real interest rates are low, people are forced to buy different things other than cash and bonds if they want to sort of make a return. And mm. gold is one of the things that they can buy, for, buy to do that. So other assets tend to rally too when real interest rates on the 10-year fall. And it's a bit of a proxy for sort of like the opportunity cost of capital. Again, a bit of a jargon term there. So when the opportunity cost of capital is low, the gold price rallies as well. And again, the, I think the correlation there throughout time has been at 0 0.75 over the past 10 years. So again, predictive mm. gold price. So there you two, they're the two things you're best, best off looking at. Yeah, those are, that's actually stronger than I thought, 0 0.75. Um, the, the interesting thing, and it makes sense here, right, is for a lot of people like in Australia right now, uh, when you have such high inflation, but you've got interest rates at say like four or five percent in your bank account, a lot of people go, "Well, I'm losing money." Like after inflation, I'm losing money. So, what do I do? What's my alternative? 
you can see why that would be a driver of the gold price for at least some of people's portfolios. Um, there is one extra thing that I want to talk about because this conversation is more about like ETFs and uh, commodities, generally speaking. But there's one more thing I want to talk about, which is uh, Globalex has a range of like ETFs that target particular themes, but they relate in many ways to commodities. So say for like green metals, as an example, or yeah. even uranium, um, maybe a slightly different example with that. But how do you think about ETFs that provide exposure to a thematic based probably on metals, like green metals, for example, but it does it through equity exposure. And how should other investors think about that? Yeah, I think the, the way I would think of it uh, and the way I do think about it is it depends which metal you're after. So if you're after gold, the gold price has been a lot better performing than the share prices of gold miners for the past mm you know, 10, 20 years. And that that may, uh, you know, surprise some people to hear that. So if you do buy gold, at least over the past 10, 20 years, again, past performance is no guide to future performance. You're in a pretty, if you buy a gold ETF, you're in a pretty secure structure and in a better performing one. But if you're after something like lithium, if you're after something like rare earth metals miners, you've really got to go the equity route, right? I mean, you, you pro, I'm sure you remember from grade 10, um, grade 10 chemistry, what happens when they put lithium on the water? You remember how that, how it like fizzes yeah. and burns and all the rest of it. So you can't really buy lithium directly because that'll be what happens to you. And <laughs> if you do warehouse it, it slowly decays. So if you want to trade the lithium spot price, one of your best ways of doing that is to buy lithium miners because they're correlated to, you want, obviously, I, I take it as given that people understand that the value of mining companies is heavily determined by the value of what they mine. So, you know, the lithium price goes up, so does the share price of lithium miners and so on. Mm. So if you're after a metal like lithium, you've sort of really got to go the equity route. That's the, that's the only option available to you. Um, same with rare earths. If you want to buy something like neodymium, again, you've got to go the equity route. Just um, you can't buy neodymium on the spot market. Um, but yeah, what are, the, what are the strengths and weaknesses of each approach for uh, some of the metals where you can choose, uh, maybe like copper, because you can always buy copper futures or buy copper at the LME, um, or you can buy copper miners. Um, the strengths of buying miners are, of course, you get the dividends. People mm -hmm. love dividends, especially in Australia. You get negative tax rate via franking credits and all the rest of it. Um, and the, some of these mining companies have also been quite solidly performing. Uh, but the weaknesses, of course, are of going the mining route. You're buying a balance sheet. You're buying a management team. So maybe you'll get a good management team. Maybe you won't. Maybe you'll get a nice balance sheet with a mm. lot of cash flow, uh, not much debt, but maybe you won't. Um, whereas if you go the physical route and you buy the actual copper, you don't have to worry about that. But um, with buying actual copper or buying um, another industrial metal like zinc or whatever, you have to worry about warehousing costs, which can be very substantial. So I think it's like 2.5% a year if you want to warehouse copper in the LME's warehouses in London um yeah so and there's also it's also more expensive to trade so it really depends on which metal you're targeting um because that'll determine what avenues are open to you um and then there's various strengths and weaknesses of each approach so, yeah trying to understand the underlying right like yeah. in what what like that lithium is a really good example i think i'm, I'm not going <laughs> to forget that one um yeah so i've got two more questions for you um the first is uh, more general in nature. And it's just asking you, having been in this industry for a very long time, like from an ETF perspective, um, how you think about investing risk and maybe what, how does that, if it does differ from what we're taught in finance schools, uh, in what way? Yeah, so the way I'm sure, I'm sure you remember, I know I do, the way they teach you to think about risk in, you know, introductory finance courses is sort of volatility, right? Um, so mm. it's how much does it move up and down? You know, what's the difference from its average and all the rest of it, in distance from the mean? Um, for me, uh, I, I think one thing that's over, well, there's a couple of things going on there. The first is in academic finance, they love to put numbers on everything. Like it's a heavily quantitative discipline. Um, and the more quantitative and more complex the formulas are, the better at least if you're looking for a career in academia. Um, but for me, I think uh, that overlooks a crucial component of markets and of investing, and that is the whole thing's backstopped by governments, right? Mm. We saw in 2008, you know, the US government, the Australian government, the British government come in and just bail everything out, every, everything out. We saw something similar during COVID with the quantitative easing that we saw. Um, we see whenever the Australian property market tends to fall, and for most people, you know, their biggest investment they'll ever make is in their house, right? They don't. ETFs will only never will always just compare in comparison to you know the value of the house. 
the Australian government has all kinds of tools at its disposal that it uses mm -hmm. to get property prices up, whether it's lowering the minimum, lowering the minimum deposits, lowering, um, lowering uh, interest rates, uh, tax offsets, and all the rest of it. So I think one thing that the academic literature does overlook is that side of things, that government intervention, that government backstop, it doesn't really feature in any of the risk modeling. Um, and for that reason, I think it can also tend to exaggerate a bit the, it's like, gotta be careful saying that, don't I? This, it can, you know, overstate potentially the risks of investing simply because, you know, look what's happened the past 15, 20 years, whenever these awful events do occur, you know, in comes the government to save the day and, um, mm. you know, lowers the risk profile of investing quite considerably. Interesting. Interesting. Um, okay, my final question is the hardest one, but I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, yeah. I just want to say, like, if you want to hear more from David or um, what the team at GlobalX are doing, you can find a link in the show notes, globalxetfs.com.au. Produce a heap of white papers uh, and insights reports on thematics and different types of things across the industry, including the ETF industry as a whole. Um, but mate, the final question is like, what's one thing? So we've already talked about academic theory, which is one that I haven't around risk. That's one that I haven't heard come up before, but what's one thing that you believe about investing or business or life in general? I always think these coax out some interesting perspectives that few people would agree with you on. All right. The sort of, I gotta be, again, sort of careful what I say here. You know, I don't want to get in too much trouble, but, uh, <laughs> The, I'm, I'm a big believer that young people should consider borrowing money to invest in shares and other, uh, other assets in the same way that they do borrow money to invest in property. So a lot of Australians, in fact, may, maybe even most of them are happy to go into a lifetime of debt servitude to invest in uh, residential property. And they do so on the understanding that over the long term, uh, property prices tend to go up. And so the, the, the debt that they're taking on constitutes an investment and the growing value of their property will offset whatever growth in the value of the debt they take on may be. You could equally apply that argument to investing in property and investing in housing, to investing in shares and investing in uh, other assets too, right? I mean, over the long term, the ASX 200 goes up just in the way, just in the same way that the Australian property market does, right? Mm. So why can't you, for instance, borrow money, take out some kind of loan and invest in the ASX 200 in the same way that you do invest in residential property, right? It's the same concept. Mm. It's the same. It's potentially the same, same result. So I'm, I'm, I'm a big believer in that, and especially for people who do have time on their side, people maybe in their 20s or in their early to mid 30s. This is a, I, I think it's a, an approach that merits consideration. Obviously, there's uh, an enormous amount of risk there, potentially. Uh, there is when you buy a house, right? When you borrow half a million dollars to buy a house, there's a huge amount of risk there too. Um, you can end up in negative equity. Uh, you can lose your ability. If you become unemployed, you can lose your ability to service the loan, whatever else. So, so I'm not saying, I'm not pretending there's not risk. I, my, my view is but it is something that young people should keep an open mind to. Mm. And, you know, there are, there are funds on the market that sort of do that for you. If you want, yeah, keep an open mind to it. Yeah, it's, it's um, I did not expect you to say that in any way, shape, or form. Uh, it's a question we get asked about a lot, and there are multiple different ways to do it. Some of them much more risky than other ways. Um, some ways, like I probably wouldn't do myself, yeah. uh, and some ways I would consider doing. Um, and yeah. I think the key with that. I thought you said rightly pointed out the upside and the downside is to get advice if you're confused in any way because it yeah. it can go wrong. And it's that old uh, what is it Dunning Kruger effect, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 People yeah. who rubbish at things tend to think they're the best. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's yeah. it. Yeah. So yeah. use you like you said, use wisely can yeah. do great things, but use poorly can do equally or if not worse things. So yeah. um, that's fascinating, that mate. I love it. I love that you went in that direction. That's why I asked that question. And uh, it, was, it was a pleasure to finally get to chat with you. And I know that you are, uh, you, some people might regard you as kind of the professor at ETF University. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> so um, I do, I do really appreciate you taking some time to share some of that accumulated wisdom with, with myself and the team, mate. I really appreciate okay. it. Thanks, it's a pleasure to be here. So, uh, yeah, likewise, I'm a big fan, a big fan of the popularization of investing that you guys are doing and the grassroots efforts you guys are making too. And, um, yeah, it's a pleasure to meet you at long last as well. Yeah, yeah. cheers, David. Bye for now, mm. mate. I'll see you yeah. next time. Take care, dude. Ciao. Bye.